they may suffer from an eminence, but in him he does destroy them. The village scripture sing of this character. Our spiritual master is the ocean of mercy, the friend of the poor, and the Lord master of the of peace. O master, be the mercy unto us. You are the shade of the world of sea. You are praying and spread the world of three worlds. We take shelter of the world of the sea.
नमस्ते सरस्वती देव दौड़वानिक शर्मे निवेशेशा
Sampari Bhaktacharya, Astro Tarsata Divine Grace, AC Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Eskandiviti, Founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Dayam Vishnipad, Paramaham Sampari Bhaktacharya, Astro Tarasata Divine Grace, Isimad Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada Ki, Ananta Koti Vaishnava Vrindaki, Namacharya Shri Hari Das Takuraki, Prem Sikaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Dweta Gradha, Shri Vas, Lord of Bhakti Vrindaki, Shri Shri Radha Krishna, Gopa Gopinath, Shamakun, Dragakun, Giri Govardhan Ki, Vrindavan Dham Ki, Namadvi Mayapur Dham Ki, Jagannath Puri Dham Ki, Ganga Maya Ki, Muru Devi Ki, Shumati Tutsi Maharani Ki, Shri Bhakti Devi Ki, Harinam Sankirtan Ki, Riyat Pradhanda Shri Prabhupada's Book Distribution Ki, Sama Dera Bhakti Vrinda Ki, O Pranam Ki, O Glorious to the Assembly of Bhakti, O Glorious to the Assembly of Bhakti, O Glorious to the Assembly of Bhakti, O Glorious to Shri Guru and Shri Gauranda, O Glorious to Shri Gauranda,
Hallelujah. 
shelter of your lotus feet. It's King Satchira speaking to the Lord. Purple. It is said, Kames te ste rita janaha prapadyante nya devataha. People in general being motivated by material desires worship the demigods to get fruitive results very quickly. People generally do not become devotees of Lord Vishnu, since Lord Vishnu never becomes the order supplier of his devotee. Lord Vishnu does not give a devotee benedictions that will create a further demand for benedictions. By worshipping the demigods one may get results. But, as described in Bhagavad Gita, 
antabatu falante sham tadbavat yaupa veda sham. Whatever great benedictions one may achieve from the demigods are all temporary. Because the demigods themselves are temporary, their benedictions are also temporary and have no permanent value. Those who aspire for such benedictions have a poor fund of knowledge. The benedictions of Lord Vishnu are different. By the mercy of the Lord Vishnu, one can be completely freed from material contamination and go back home, back to Godhead. Therefore, the benedictions offered by the demigods cannot compare to even one ten thousandth of the Lord's benedictions. One should not therefore try to obtain benedictions from the demigods or false gurus. One should aspire only for the benediction offered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As the Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 1866, Sava Dharman Parityya Jama Mekam Sharanam Vraja Am Tvam Sava Papi Vyo Moksha Yisham Masu Abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reaction, do not fear. This is the greatest benediction. Magyana Timuranda Syakya Nijina Shalakaya Chakshu Milita Mina Tasma Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chetani Vino Vishtam Stapatam Yena Bhutale Swami Pagadama Yandadati Swapadanti Kha Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uttapadakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sagana Raghunatam Vitam Tvam Sajiva Sadvaitam Savadutam Virjana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahakna Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Sacha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Pandu Jagapate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavya Shri Vishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Kha Manchika Patra Vesha Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha Padita Nam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnavi Vrindavama Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadada Shri Vasani Gaura Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram Ram So, uh, again, back. asking for the blessings of the seniors and all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. So, <laughs> this um, very intelligent statement from the king, neither all the demigods nor the so-called gurus nor all other people, either independently or together, can offer mercy that equals even one ten thousand of yours, therefore I wish to take shelter of your lotus feet. So this is a symptom of intelligence. There's a calculation that's been made here. That considering that wherever I take shelter, I will never be able to get as much help and benediction from anyone else as I can if I take shelter at your lotus feet, my dear Lord. Therefore, I'm wishing to take shelter of you. And this is actually the a saint calculation. So in this purple Prabhupada talks about Alpa Meda Shaha. Like it actually sometimes is translated as less intelligent. And also we know in the Bhagavatam the devotees are described as Sumeda Shaha. They're the most intelligent. Because this is the calculation. Everyone works on an illusion. The illusion is that if you do something material and if you take material shelter, you'll be protected. But you're not going to be protected. Because the material shelter itself is an unstable situation. So no matter, no matter what you take shelter of materially, it is destined to ultimately fall apart. And we are taking shelter. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, every single one of us are taking shelter of something. In some cases the shelter is gross, in some cases the shelter is subtle. But we are all, by dint of the very nature of the living entity, we are all taking shelter of something. 
One of the dangers of spiritual life is that we can take shelter of the mind. And the mind includes all of our misconceptions. And the, the teachings of the Bhagavatam is an attempt to correct the misconceptions of the, of the mind. The misconceptions that we have gathered over hundreds of thousands of billions of lifetimes in the material world. Uh, the root cause of all suffering is ignorance. Ignorance means a misconception. Mm. As we said before, there's a difference between what we purport to believe and what we actually believe. What you actually believe is expressed by how you live. Mm. So, if I say that I believe the Supreme is and the Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but my life is centered around something else, it means that there is some lacking in your real acceptance of that fact. Prabhupada was on a morning walk with the devotees one morning, and at one point he just stuck his cane in the ground and said, The trouble is that none of you believe in Krishna. And, and it was a very profound point. The trouble is that none of you believe in Krishna. So there's degrees of belief. And therefore Krishna is explaining abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. Degrees of belief mean degrees of surrender. Whatever you believe in is what you surrender to. It's that simple. So I may claim to be a devotee, but the fact that I surrender more to the material energy means that I believe more in the material energy than I believe in Krishna. And, and you can't fake it. Everything has its lakshana. Everything has its, its own symptom. Now this interesting, that the Prabhupada has, has quoted this verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Abandon all varieties of religion, just surrender unto me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reactions, do not fear. But we do have a fear. And therefore, what is indicated indirectly here is that because of our fear, therefore we don't surrender. In other words, we have a fear that if we surrender to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Will we be taken care of? So where does that where does that fear come from? It comes from the experience of the material world. Because we've taken shelter of so many aspects of the material energy and we've been disappointed. Right now in the subtle body of every living entity, they have the samskars, the remembrance of taking shelter of different things and being profoundly and intensely disappointed. And therefore, there is always this anxiety, consciously or unconsciously. If I, if I take shelter of this or this, what, what is going to happen? <coughs> mm. So there is fear. And the antidote to fear is love. Mm. Real, loving experience. And Krishna, you see, there's this saying that if, if you take a step towards Krishna, he'll take a, a hundred steps or a million steps towards us. Mm. So you have to test the proposition of the Shastra. It's making a claim. Okay? Do you believe this claim? And how can we test this claim? And therefore, what are the devotees doing? We are spiritual scientists. Okay? <coughs> that is the actual point. We are applying the science of Krishna consciousness. Adhyatma Vidya Vidya Krishna says of sciences, I'm the supreme science of self-realization. At the same time, the Bhagavad Gita talks about things which are meant to be feared. Fear has a value. Yeah. Fear is an extraordinarily powerful catalyst. It has tremendous value if it is utilized in the correct way. So generally, we think if I, if I surrender more, what's going to happen to me? Right? So we have a fear of surrender. If I surrender more, what, what will happen? Will, will Krishna come through? Will the devotees come through for me? So the first aspect of this is to surrender intelligently. There is a form of laziness that takes place in spiritual life where people are quote-unquote surrendering, but they don't surrender their intelligence. How do you surrender your intelligence? You surrender your intelligence by utilizing your intelligence in Krishna consciousness. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about the, one of the symptoms in the mode of ignorance. Right? They confuse religion with irreligion. Mm -hmm. So if a devotee is sentimental, what you're actually doing is you're confusing the mode of goodness with the mode of ignorance. Mm -hmm. So discrimination is symptomatic of the mode of goodness. Sentiment 
is symptomatic of the mode of ignorance. And therefore, we have many devotees in our movement who have been burned in the association of devotees, and they've not really been able to understand what actually happened. Right? What actually happened was not that the teachings were wrong. It was that we did not have a proper scientific understanding how to apply the teachings. Right? The teachings are perfect. The teachings are absolutely perfect. But our application of that same teaching is often very, very lacking. But back to this point about fear. So we fear. And part of that fear is when we don't apply things properly, we get a bad result. Then we think, maybe this isn't true. I tried to surrender. Krishna said surrender. Sava Dhamma and Krishna I got some bad result. Maybe this isn't true. But how do you know you got a bad result? Bad from whose perspective? Bad from whose perspective? There's a pastime of the king. He was given a sword as a gift from a neighboring king. A very beautiful, ornate sword, very valuable, encrusted with very precious gems and so on, made of precious metals. So one day the king is cleaning the sword. One day the king is cleaning the sword. While he's cleaning the sword, he cuts himself on the edge of the sword. Immediately he's bleeding and in a lot of pain. If you've ex ever experienced cutting yourself, it can be really annoying, annoyingly painful. So the king calls for his advisor. He says, my dear advisor, look, look what happened. I, I cut myself on, on this sword. What, what do you have to say about this? The advisor says to him, my dear king, this is Krishna's mercy. Upon hearing that, the king became angry. <laughs> You're saying that because it didn't happen to you, right? You're saying that because you're the one who's in pain and bleeding. And the king gets really irritated. He tells these guards, guards, throw this impudent servant of mine in the prison. Right? So they, the advisor's thrown in prison. The king, later that day, goes on his regular tour of the kingdom. As he's going on his regular tour of the kingdom, as he goes through the forest, the king is captured by cannibals. Right? They're looking at the king and they're thinking, hmm, Prashadam time, right? <laughs> So the king is given over to the priest. The priest is preparing the king for this, this ritual. Right? They're going to sacrifice him, human sacrifice. At one point in the proceedings, the priest says, stop the proceedings and let him go. And, and the, the people, are, the cannibals are shocked, like, why? He says, let him go. He said, we, we can't use him. And they're, why? Why exactly can't we use him? He says, he's not a perfect specimen. Look at his finger. Right? Polish body is missing, so we can't use it. You have to let him go. You cannot offer him in sacrifice. So they let the king go. The king, upon seeing this happen, feeling tremendous relief about being let go, he realizes the wisdom of the words of his advisor. And actually, he's, he's genuinely sorry about what he did to the advisor. He gets back to the palace, he tells the guards, get this advisor, bring him back from the prison. And he apologizes. He says, you know, to be really honest with you, this is what happened. And, and I'm sorry. You know, when, when you told me <laughs> that this was Christian mercy, I, I didn't understand that. I was angry at you for in jail. And, and I apologize, you know, but because you were right, if they, you know, because I'd cut my finger, they let me go, otherwise I'd have been in serious trouble. And the advisor takes it very gracefully. The king does ask him one other question now. He says, just before you go, I do, I do have one query. Now, I understand that when I cut my finger, you said this was Christian mercy upon me. And it makes complete sense. I, I understand that. However, when you told me that I became angry with you, and I had you thrown in prison, right? so I can understand how cutting my finger was Christian's mercy upon me, but I don't understand how it was Krishna's mercy upon you. And the advisor tells the king, he said, my dear king, he said, normally when you go on the tour of the kingdom, he said, normally I come with you. So what would have happened is, they would have let you go and they would have sacrificed me instead. So you cutting your finger, that was Krishna's mercy upon you. And when you got angry and had me thrown in prison, that was Krishna's mercy upon me. 
Now the question we need to ask ourselves is how often do you think like that? Yeah. This is what I mean. Material conception. This is something good, this is something bad. But according to what perspective? According to whose time frame? The, the, the real question we should be asking ourselves in every situation, question number one, Krishna, what are you trying to teach me through this experience? Right? This is a transcendental perspective. This is the Shastra perspective. Question number one, Krishna, what are you trying? I understand. I accept that you are on my side. Right? You are on my side. Jai Shri Shri Radha Gopinath Jai Shri Shri Radha Gopinath Jai Shri Shri Radha Jai Shri Shri Radha Shri Shri Radha Jai Shri Shri Radha Jai Shri Shri Radha Jai Shri So, the first thing is, Krishna, I know you're on my side. You're compassionate. You've declared it, Samoham Sava that you're equal, kind, merciful to everyone. You declared it. Not only have you declared it in the Bhagavad Gita, you came to the material world in the Kalamuka and you personally demonstrated it. Right? right? The evidence of the mercy is that you've delivered even fallen individuals such as Jagai and Madai. Right? You've proved it consistently. Right? There's even a step beyond this. You sent your pure devotee who's even more merciful than you are. Sure, Prabhupada has come. There's even more demonstration of mercy. Right? So, I know you're on my side, so, and you're, you are the supreme controller. Right? Ishpara Parama Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigraha. Anadi Adi Govinda Sava Karana Karana. You are the supreme control. So anything that's going on, first question, what are you trying to teach me from this experience? Question number one. Question number two, how do you want me to respond? If you have this kind of mentality, you will always be enthusiastic in spiritual life. Right? You're dealing with a person who has more concern for your well-being than you yourself have. So there's two aspects of this. There's Dharma and Sanatana Dharma. When, when things happen, the first question we can ask ourselves, in addition to these two, is have I, have I, done the pro have I behaved properly? Right? Because sometimes something goes wrong and it's not because Christians are merciful, it's because we're incompetent. Right? You didn't do that. They, they wrote a letter to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, can we pray to Krishna for a Sankirtan bag? He says, yes, as long as you also do the work to get the money to pay for the bag. Right? So am I doing what I meant to do? We want to be proper because we do not want to give Krishna the service. That's the first point. But at the same time, in every activity, always make sure the devotion is there first. Right? In this purport, it talks about the first sentence. People in general, being motivated by material desires, worship demigods to get fruit of activities. Your motive is everything. Baba Drahi Janadana, because Krishna accepts the essence of a devotee's service. Your motive is everything. So in every activity, everything that you're going to say, everything that you're going to do, first of all, make sure the devotion is there first. Make sure that you're doing it for the right reason because that will immediately attract the presence of the Supreme Personality of God. And that's not a small thing. Mm -hmm. We say that the devotee is Krishna conscious. Yeah, really, that's true. But when Prabhupada talks about devotee, he means pure devotee. The sadhaka is not always Krishna conscious. Actually, if you want to be very technical about it, the sadhaka is sometimes Krishna conscious, sometimes selfish. Other times Krishna conscious, sometimes self-centered, sometimes completely wounded, sometimes doing things which are completely outside of Krishna consciousness. So this point of shelter is very powerful. You're sheltered when you take shelter. When you do something outside of Guru Sadhu Shastra, you've just stepped out of the circle of protection. Right? Just like Sita Devi, the circle's there. As long as you stay in the circle, no one can touch you. But if you get out, if you step, even if you step an inch out of the circle, you're on your own. Right? So Krishna consciousness is actually a degree to which we take shelter. 
You want to be materialistic and expect that you're going to be fully protected. It doesn't work that way. It is yayatamam prapadyante. Right? So in many cases, if we reflect upon our lives honestly and see where we had some real difficulty, it's when we stepped outside of the circle. Mm-hmm. And, and Krishna's like, well, what, what else can I say to you? I'm telling you that if you take my shelter, I can protect you. But if you insist on doing something else, he'll still protect you, but you get the indirect lesson. Just to give a very simple example, sometimes you have very clever parents, right? Very clever parents. When the children get to teenage years, right? What does, what does Chanaki say? Not to five and treat them like a king. Five to, um, five to 15, you, you make them very responsible. When they hit 16 and so on, you treat them like a friend, right? Because when they're 16, when the child is 15 years old, their psychology is that I'm the oldest child. The moment they hit 16, and sometimes it varies, but around that age, they see themselves as the youngest adult. So the psychology changes. That's actually in Shastra. In Ayurveda, they mention these things. Right? So therefore, when they hit that kind of age, if you're still talking to them like they're a child, they just think, okay, I've had enough. Right? I'm an adult, you're speaking to me like a little kid. And that's what breaks the trust between the child and the parent, and the child starts not speaking openly to the parent. Right? So some parents are very clever. They know that when the child has reached a certain level of maturity, they can say what they like, but if the child doesn't listen, what you do is you create an environment where they have to learn the hard way. Right? <coughs> and you're there, but you're there to support them. Right, okay, if you insist, if you insist, no, mom, it'll be okay, I'll just mess around when I'm, when I'm studying at school. No, I think you should work at, at school because it's going to be a bit hard to get a job when you, when you leave if you don't. No, no, it's all right, I'll just play with my friends, I can catch up. Okay, then it's like, what could you do? You have to let them fail the exam and reset the year. Right? And then they fail the exams, so next year they have to work twice as hard. And, you know, really, you could tell them. You told them this isn't a good idea. But they didn't listen. In other words, the things they can't catch by hearing, you have to let them catch it by experience. And Krishna's exactly like that. I'm trying to tell you something through the scripture. Can you hear? Can you hear what I'm saying to you? Because the things that you don't want to accept, that's where you have to burn yourself before you get the point. So you step out of the circle, the material energy beats you up, then you come back into the circle and like, out, is that here? Okay. Right? But you learn, you've got the same point, but you have to learn the hard way. So this point, Sumedasha, how intelligent are you? Your ability, your, your level of intelligence is directly symptomized by how many things you can catch just by hearing. Right? Because to catch it by hearing is the most subtle. Right? So that's goodness. Then, the things you can't catch just by hearing, then you have to see. It's less, it's still more, it's still, it's, it's more gross, right? You have to see it. And seeing means really, you see someone else. You see the lesson play out in someone else's life. That's the mode of passion, because more of your senses have to be engaged. I, I have to see it. Oh, I saw that this person doesn't behave properly, and I saw what happened to them over time. Right? They lost all their friends, people don't want to associate with them, so that's, that taught me a lesson. That's not a good way to behave. Got it. Mode of passion. But you catch it by seeing. Mode of ignorance is it has to cut, be up close and personal. You have to go through some bad experience directly yourself. Right? You see, it goes from subtle to the gross. But we all have a mixture of all three. We learn a certain proportion of things by hearing. We learn a certain proportion of things by seeing, and there's a certain proportion of things Christians like, dude, okay, you just aren't going to get it any other way, so you have to feel it directly in your life. <coughs> okay? But those proportions can change. The more that we make a sincere attempt to really be Christian conscious, those proportions can change. And, and therefore, Christian consciousness is, is, in a sense, it is like an accelerated, learn, uh, accelerated process of spirituality. And accelerate, the more you catch by hearing, you catch it, understand it, you move with it, the greater the success is. And bhakti breeds bhakti. This is the other point. Right? The more you invest your faith in Krishna, the more he reciprocates with you, the more you have direct, tangible realization that he's real. And the more enthusiastic you are to surrender even more to him. It's just like a good relationship. You trust the person in some way, they, 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 they came through for you. Right? So you have more faith the next time to go a bit deeper and to trust them a bit more. 
It, it is a process of relationship. And God is in the religion business. Sorry, man is in the religion business. God is in the relationship business. Therefore, Krishna says, abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. Get the point. Right? It's a personal reciprocation. It's a personal relationship. Ultimately, Krishna consciousness is an affair of the heart. So no one can fake it. Which is the, the greatness of it, but it's also the danger of it. You can do as much external activity as you want. Right? But Krishna is accepting who are you doing it for, why are you doing it. It's very powerful, therefore, in Krishna consciousness to understand the value of detachment. Right? And, and it's not easy to really get to grips with this one. What, what does that mean, right? The value of detachment. It actually means that the service mentality is more important than the service. You're trying to make an offering. Because we don't understand the value of detachment, we only think it's significant if the outcome comes. But what you don't understand is it, it all belongs to Krishna anyway. And the outcome is based upon his choice. But the, but the endeavor to offer something, that's all about you. It's difficult to believe because our entire experience of the material world is so gross, especially in Kali Yuga. So it's difficult to believe that if I offer something, if I try my best and it doesn't work out, Krishna is still satisfied. Hard to believe, right? It's very difficult to believe, but it's true. It's true. Do you think that the first year that Prabhupada came to the West and was preaching in America and no one came, no one came, if you really love Mita, he's going to the docks thinking that this is a failed mission, maybe I should go back to India. And this is a Nitya Siddha Maha Bhagavad, pure devotee of the Lord. So do you think that in that year when he's trying and, and there's no external result, do you think that Krishna's like, I'm displeased with him? But there's no result, no result. When he's in India, begging people, come to the West with me so we can spread this movement. And not one single individual, not one person is prepared to go. Do you think Krishna's like, oh, no, you're a failure, you haven't done, you, you, what, what's wrong with you? No, because Krishna is seeing this consistent endeavor. Right? It's difficult to, it's difficult to accept because we don't really believe what we read. That's the point. You've heard it, but you didn't accept it. Yeah, yeah, it says that, but really, mm, yeah, mm. No. You, the glory of the devotee is that they never give up trying. What that means for us as devotees is you will either succeed in spreading Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission, or you will die in the endeavor to achieve that goal. You will either be successful or you will die trying to be successful. Those are the only two options available. Right? You'll be successful or you'll die trying. And if you die trying, you're even more successful because you're going to go back home back to God. So this process is, is not, it's not like the material process. And, and our trouble is we have the material process in here. We have the material world in here. It's not just the material, it's here. This is where the material world is. So we carry all of this material baggage and these material conceptions onto the spiritual platform. And worse than that, we're expecting the spiritual process to work according to our material expectation. Right? And, that's the, and that's the real cause of our frustration. That's the thing that's causing us to be frustrated. Krishna wants you to make an adjustment. Right? The point is, he wants you to accept this. I know how the material energy works. And you know how I know how the material works? Because I'm the one who created it. So I'm telling you, this is how it's going to work. This is how it's going to work. If you accept it, you can start to, you, then you come in contact with reality. You accept reality. I will describe to you exactly how the material energy works and how the spiritual energy works and what you should do to go back on that to go to. If you choose not to accept it, then you'll still get to, you'll still understand how it works, but you'll understand through some harsh experience. And, and it goes through every aspect of the material world and every aspect of the spiritual process as well. And we often talk about this. Change your expectations in line with Guru Sadhu Shastra. Right? 
The devotees upset me. Okay, what's, what does the Shastra say about No, but the devotees should be nice and they should smile at people. But what does the scripture say about the devotees? It says the Kanishta Adhikaras are going to act like this. It says the Madhim Adhikaras are going to act like this and the Uttama Adhikaras are going to act like this. Okay, were, they, were the person who, was, who behaved in a grossly negative way, were they a Kanishta Adhikari, a Madhim Adhikari or an Uttama Adhikari? Oh, um, I think they were Kanishta Adhikari. Okay, so the Kanishta Adhikari, who do they... Who do they understand? They understand the presence, they accept the presence of the deity and guru. Do they know how to deal with the devotees properly? No. Do they deal with you properly? No. So is that exactly what Krishna said that they were going to do? Yeah, it is. So <coughs> what, what, why are you shocked? What exactly, what exactly is different from what you were told directly by Krishna, by Prabhupada, through the books? What, what exactly was out of touch of reality? Nothing. Hmm? They're acting exactly as you were told that they would act. Hmm? Okay, what do you do about it? Well, you know, the village should be like this. Okay, but how do people get you to be at your best? I am at my best when people inspire me. So what do you do? I don't inspire anyone. I will force them and, and shout at them and tell them they have to behave differently. Okay, so if it doesn't work for you, why would it work for anyone else? I don't, I don't know. Why would it work? You change when you're inspired. If people push you around and start being rude to you and negative, does that get the best out of you? No. So, when you do that to other people, is that going to get the best out of them? I, I don't think so. Okay, so is that, a, is that an intelligent way to deal with it? So, Atma Everyone sees the world from their own perspective. That actually isn't a bad thing. You can understand Bhaktivinoda Otako says that one of the ways in which we can have compassion for others is to understand our own experience of the material world. We have our own experience of the material world. It's difficult, it's painful, it's negative, right? So you can understand, therefore, if it's difficult, painful, negative, if I've had bad experiences in the material world, then I can understand something about what other people have gone through as well. Right? That's the point. But the question is, am I willing to put myself in another person's shoes? Right? Or do I think I'm so unique and special that I've had a bad experience? Everyone should understand me, but I don't have to understand anyone else because I am the Supreme Personality of Godhead. What sits beneath all of these things is we still have this conception that I'm the center of attention. It's all about me and Krishna and, and, and everything about the material world is screaming, you know what? It is not about you. Right? That's the point. It, nothing's about you, actually. Okay, your mum will actually. Okay. But apart from that, <laughs> it's not about you. Okay? That's the point. And, and, and the sooner we get out of the center, the more happy we'll be. Right? It's, this is not a, it's not a harsh thing to say. It's a fact. The, the point is, whatever is true, you just have to deal with it. We have to deal with reality. The quicker we deal with reality, the easier life becomes. Technically, someone who's out of touch with reality, that's called insanity. You know that? That's the definition of insanity. Someone who is out of touch with reality. And the first thing is you're out of touch with reality, and therefore the natural symptom is you're unable to navigate reality. Right? Because you, can't even, you don't even see what's, what the reality is. So how are you going to maneuver a situation that you haven't even, you don't even recognize? <coughs> so, a few points on that. Um, I'll say a few other things because we'll try and make sure we finish it about five two because I need to pack my things and yeah, get to my room before nine. Okay. So I was thinking about this, 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 this experience of suffering, right? And this point, see, in technically, in one sense, this verse is actually incorrect, in one sense. Because it's saying, um, neither demigods nor the so-called gurus nor all other people, either independently or together, can offer mercy that equals even one ten thousandth of yours. That's not technically true. There are living entities who can offer mercy in, in a way which is completely significant. And that's a pure devotee. The pure devotee is a person, right? But what is? But why is it true and not true? He's a person, 
But whose mercy is he giving? Yeah, he has Krishna's mercy. So Krishna Kashini, the pure devotee can control Krishna. See, if he says, Krishna, please be merciful to this person. Krishna, okay, well, I wouldn't do it for some of these other guys. Because they're a bit, I'm not sure about them. Okay, but Prabhupada, you're asking. Okay, done. There was a pastime. I don't know if the person's name was Bhakti Steve. In Prabhupada's time, the person committed suicide. Technically, scripturally, that is a sinful activity, right? It's considered sinful to take your own life, right? <coughs> Prabhupada heard about it. Prabhupada immediately started praying to the Lord. Dear Krishna, please allow the soul of this particular person to immediately take birth again in the Vaishnava family to, co- to carry on his spiritual progress. Right? So you have the ledger of the law, you have this, this wrong, ah, you shouldn't have done that. But the mercy of the devotee, Krishna will reciprocate with that. The Supreme Personality of God will reciprocate. That pure devotee is carrying the Lord's mercy. And he has a relationship. Right? We were discussing this yesterday. So you have a, so you have to be really clear on the reality of what's going on. This term prakrita bhakta means materialist devotee. And so many of us, we still have so many material aspects to our to our endeavor. So for example, that you're in a community and there is a service that needs to be done. Okay? You go you go to, to devotee A and you tell the devotee we need your help, we need you to do this service. The devotee says to you, no, I'm, I'm busy, I've got a lot to do. Right? You need the service, you ask them, they clear what the service is, I'm busy, I've got a lot on, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Okay, now, you tell another devotee, oh, you know, we haven't got anyone to do this particular service. Your friend that you tell, they go and ask the same person that you asked. And that person who said no to you, says yes to them. Why, why is it that when you ask, you got to no. know, when they ask, they got a yes. Why? Relationship. Relationship, right? Think about it. So what happened was, you asked, you don't have much of a relationship, you haven't done much for that particular person, they haven't got that connection to you, right? Now you told someone else, now they asked that same person, but they've got a relationship, they've helped that person out, they've been there for that person when that person was in difficulty. The person feels obliged to them. It's the same service that you were asking about, but because of the relationship, they get a completely different response. Now you may say that's unfair, but that's an eternal fact. What's going on with us is that Prabhupada has a relationship with Krishna. You understand? He is a pure devotee, he has no envy towards the Lord, he's been serving him since time immemorial. We may ask the deity for something. Well, you, are, you don't really like me, do you? Eh? Dear Krishna, help me. You don't really like me, do you? If you had the chance, you'd be on the altar. Eh? Okay. You've surrendered to me this much, so I will reciprocate with you this much. But if Prabhupada asks for the same thing for you, okay, Prabhupada, your surrender to me is complete. Because you're asking... I feel, there's, I feel obliged, I feel a, a desire, not even an obligation. I feel a desire to reciprocate with your pure love. So, on one hand you could say, oh it's unfair, it's, it's, it's spiced. But actually, on the other hand, it's an eternal principle that people will reciprocate based upon the relationship. Right? I remember, I gave a talk in my company years ago. And it was about networking. And, and it was based upon some research and, and some writing on this topic. And the author of the book I was using to kind of speak, and they were giving me some you know, spiritual principles as well in the, in the presentation. The author of the book was talking about how in many cases in the world, and you'll know this from experience, it's so much more about who you know, right? You have some people, they, they start these big initiatives just because they network with very influential people and sometimes they'll just get together and say, you know what, why don't we do, we should do something on this, to, on, we should do a project on this. And because it's just a few influential people who like each other, they can immediately mobilize all types of resources, all types of marketing, all types of promotion and get stuff done. Right? And this is the point we're making. You may say, oh, it shouldn't be like that, but the point is, are you in touch with reality? If Krishna says it's like that, that's a given. It means you accept it and work with it. It's not you stand back, complain, get frustrated. 
Right? People are going to do things based upon relationship. Because Krishna does things based upon relationship. Got it? That's the point. So you understand that it's a given. It's, it is a principle of reality. So therefore I work with that. Otherwise what you do is you just get frustrated about it. Why does it have to be like that? Well it's like that because God made it that way. Okay? And we have to, we have to adjust. And there's so many things like that in the Shastra. So many things like that. The sooner we adjust to what Krishna says, the easier your life will become. Right? And the easier your life will become because by accepting Krishna's words, you're accepting the guidance of a person who cares about you. The, 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 the most important thing to know about Krishna is he, he wants you to be successful. Right? Our experience in the material world is people, you know, they may have ulterior motives or mixed motives, whatever it is. The most important thing to know about Krishna, he, he's on your side, right? And in terms of empathy, he's got complete empathy because he's been sitting in your heart since time immemorial and he knows everything you've gone through. He remembers even the things that you don't recall. Right? So therefore, there's very good reason, this whole the way that Satyavra is speaking about it. If you look at it logically, there's very good reason to take shelter of Krishna and to follow through on how he wants you to respond. Right? Two questions. Number one, Krishna, what are you trying to ask as a loving friend? Right? Surita. Right? The Surita Sava Bhutanam, the, the, the supreme friend of everyone. As a loving friend. If this is happening, if I'm following you properly, and this is happening to me, there must be some ultimately positive outcome or, or lesson or learning from this. So question number one, what are you trying to teach me in this experience? And question number two, how do you want me to respond? And just to put some boundary on that, that response will always be within the realms of Vaishnava etiquette. It will always be within the realms of Guru, Sadhu, Shastra. And when you're not sure exactly how to respond, ask someone who knows better than you do. Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter 19, text number 12, purple. Every, Prabhupada says every major decision should be confirmed by some authority. That makes the matter perfect. You can read it for yourself. First canto, chapter 19, text number 12. And that's the other reason why we go into difficulty, because often we make decisions, even though Krishna says, check in with someone who's got, who's got some realization in this area, we won't do that. And that means in many cases, you're, the only person you're checking in with is your mind. Yeah, the mind carries all these material conceptions and is often going to give us bad advice. Okay. So we'll stop there. Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Janta Gopramanandi Hari. Okay, so, yes. I have, I, I want to make it brief so you can pat. Yes, uh, <laughs> please, let's pat this in. I have an addition, a correction, and a question. Go for it. Very small. The, the addition is that another definition of madness yes. is uh, to depart from the wrong premise. To words, depart from a wrong premise. Yes, so you, you may. The process may be correct, yes. but the conclusion will be wrong because the premise was that you're a or Yeah, okay. 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 The, uh, the correction is that um, when you say that Srila Prabhupada got no response uh, when he wanted to yeah. preach in the West, there was one letter from Mangal Brahmachari, yeah. um, eventually became Mangal Niloy um, Maharaj, a disciple of Keshava, but very Keshava Maharaj. The one who gave sannyas to Shri Prabhupada, he wanted to go with Prabhupada, but his guru didn't allow yeah, him. Okay. So eventually, he asked, after his guru died, he actually came to America okay. to preach. And the question is about um, just like Krishna is very merciful to make us forget, and this, the Apohanam comes in, forget about our previous lives okay. uh, so we can. We can at the time of death, we don't have so much trouble, you know, giving up, as you were speaking about the attachment, giving up things like, you know, if you remember all the families you had and all the attachments that you had, it would be very difficult. Um, how would that be applied towards bad habits that they seem to be carried for uh, many lifetimes, mm -hmm. that, that actually we cannot surrender 
because we have so many bad habits that they are very difficult to give up. So how is Krishna intervening and how do we go about it? The effort draws mercy. So we have bad habits. I mean, uh, you can get into it in, in a number of ways. First of all, some bad habits are not bad habits. They're, 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 con they're, con they're contextually bad. In other words, you have a habit. <laughs> Someone comes to mind. Let's see how, how we can play this. Um, so Prabhupada had one disciple. And Prabhupada, being very expert at how to engage people, he saw that that disciple was, could be quite fierce. Okay? So Prabhupada, rather than just say to him, don't be fierce, all he gave him was a service which allowed him to engage that particular tendency in the Lord's service. Because he knew that whatever you bring to Krishna, it will become purified. So if, if someone has a, a tendency to be fierce, if you engage it, it becomes elevated. Right? So you may say it's a bad habit, but technically it's a bad habit when it's expressed in the wrong situation. Right? So when Prabhupada says, use that quality to guard my movement, which is what Prabhupada actually told this particular person, then that same so-called bad habit, now it's a good habit because it's being utilized in the proper way. Yeah? So that's one type of bad habit. <coughs> the other type of bad habit is just something that can't be utilized at all. Right? And for that, we have to try to give it up by getting a higher taste, by understanding how when Krishna, or when the Guru Prabhupada tells us to give up something that's a bad habit, it's not, because, it's not just because they don't like it. It's because if we engage in that bad habit, we suffer as a result. Right? So there's also an argument or a way of understanding our bad habits as the things which are the precursors to our own suffering. Right? So for example, if I'm very self-centered, how am I going to have a relationship with anyone? You say, oh, well, but no devotees are friends with me. Yeah, because you're self-centered. You only care about yourself, and that's why you can't be in a relationship with anyone. So, as long as I hold on to it, I'm not going to get something that, I, that actually I need. There are certain things which are fundamental human needs. So, if I'm deeply selfish, I can't be in a good relationship with anyone. And Christians like, well, you have this bad habit of being self-centered. The only way you're going to get the thing that you need is by giving up that particular habit. So the scripture will tell us, we will see good examples, hopefully, in the community. But we have, to, we have to make the effort to change. And because it is our constitutional nature to be selfless, the effort is to come back to how we really are. And as we practice that, the mercy and the strength and the realization to make that shift will also take place as well. Because the effort attracts that particular mercy. Yeah? But to your point, there's one other thing to this. One of, the, one of the most powerful ways that we give up bad habits, along, along with having the blessings of pure devotees to do it, is by seeing good examples. Yeah? If we see good examples of people who, who don't have that bad habit, who have the opposite, the, counter, the, the other side of that, the good, the good counterpart to that bad habit, then we see how much greater their experience of Christian consciousness is, their experience of devotee interaction, and that can inspire us to keep making the determined effort to give up that bad habit. So something can be dovetailed, and some things are given up by a higher taste. That's just some answer to that. And I agree your point about the you know, response. Well, I meant really that no one came to the West with it, but I think that's a, that's a completely fair point that you made initially, yeah, in terms of coming initially. Okay. So I'm going to have to go and pack, but thank you very much for your time and your tolerance. Okay. Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Jani Tago Pramanandi,